Hi, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm your host, William Becker, and today we have the uh, the master of all things crazy, <laughs> um, paranormal, and uh, just about everything else you can think of this way, Rocky Smith. Uh, Rocky is an art teacher, and which might help explain some of his creativity, and the co-founder of the Oregon Ghost Conference, the owner of, let me see, Northwest Walking Tours, Northwest Ghost Tours, or Northwest <laughs> Ghost Tours, Haunted Oregon City. What else? What am I missing? That's it. Okay. Um, it's all the same, basically. Yeah. Different. Yeah. yeah. Different aspects of the same yeah. puzzle. Yep. He's also on the city commission and an incredibly civic-minded person who's one of the handful of people that have done more for the town he lives in than most. So welcome. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Now, we, I always try this time of year to have you on because something big is about to happen, I think. <laughs> A lot of big things are about to happen, yes. And um, um, what day is today? <laughs> today's Saturday. It is Saturday. So... Um, less than a week from today, so Friday night, um, the Oregon Ghost Conference will kick off in Seaside, Oregon, mm -hmm. and um, feel pretty good about it. We've got a lot of work to do still this week, but um, we'll be heading out to Seaside um, at the end of the week, and then uh, the conference kicks off. We'll kind of have a little get-together Thursday night at the Bridge Tender, um, and then Friday the uh, conference will start, and then uh, run through Sunday. Where can people go? Um, I want to put it down now. Where can people go for tickets and information and all that? Uh, OregonGhostConference.com is our website and all the tickets are available on there. And um, you can buy tickets ahead of time. Uh, there are a few events that have sold out, but uh, most events are still have plenty of openings and um, general admission tickets as well. Um, we sell general admission tickets for $15 to get people into the convention for the whole weekend. And that includes the vendor area and speakers um, and then classes, tours, investigations, and special events are all separate ticket prices. That way people can kind of pick and choose what they want to do. Um, and once we open the convention or conference on Friday, um, people can get their tickets either online at that point or still um, they can actually come into the ticket booth and have uh, tickets right there at the box office. So either way, um, sometimes I think people look at the website and worry that, oh, things are selling out. So it's not worth driving to the coast. But even if you plan to come to the coast for the day, uh, there's plenty of events that have tickets available. Uh, we've only, I think, sold out a few uh, of our special events or, or classes, but um, and then a couple of the investigations. But we still have tickets for, uh, we still have tickets for at least two or three of the investigations. So, great. Yeah. Um, and if people have in the audience have comments or questions, please type them in, and I can flash my magic, and we can answer them. So, um, um, just to make sure people know that. Uh, what where are you guys investigating this year i know you've got some new locations i'm not going to be there i was there last year it's always wonderful but i can't make it every year unfortunately um yeah um well we have some of the usuals um you know uh bridge tender is our our go-to um bridge tender in downtown seaside um an old tavern built in 1914 um lots Crazy of haunted. Yeah, crazy haunted, r weird rumors about the history of the place. Um, and the cool thing about the bridge tender is that most people only know of the main level, the bar itself, which, mm -hmm. as you know, when you walk into it, you just immediately feel the energy in that place. There's right. certain areas, um, especially towards the back of the building or uh, the uh, towards where the restrooms are that actually are even more active. Um, but the coolest part about the bridge tender is very few people know that it was an apartment building upstairs and that 
um, you can actually um, kind of go up there, but only once a year. Um, so the bridge tender has always allowed us to take people up to the upstairs of the bridge tender um, just during the weekend of the ghost conference. Mm -hmm. And so if, if people have always wondered about what, what, what um, is up there on the second level of bridge tender, um, this is an opportunity for that. So that's our normal, regular um, investigation every year. Um, we have um, the we we've only done one night of the Times Theater so that uh, each year. So last year was our first year doing, uh, or was it the year before? We've done the Times Theater, I think, just once last year. And then this year we'll do that again. Usually we um, kind of host a movie, but we don't have a movie premiere this year for anyone in the paranormal world. So we're doing an um, investigation anyway on Friday night. But that one is sold out. And um, the Times Theater is pretty interesting because it was an old uh, theater. It opened late 30s, early 40s, uh, okay. and then was closed in the 70s. Um, and then, you know, pretty much the last couple few decades, it was completely closed and um, now has been reopened and is really cool as a mm -hmm. center part of the city. And um, the Starry Night Inn, which is another investigation location, um, that is an old... Uh, Victorian house that's just about two blocks from uh, the convention center and it's been turned into a hotel. Um, it is a house that um, was built somewhere in the early 1900s and I, I think around 1914 or so or just a little earlier. It's kind of around the time of the bridge tender and um, you know, a little bit of our Seaside's history. They had a fire in Seaside in 1912. And so um, I feel like this house was built kind of right after the fire. Um, and I've done some research on it and the Starry Night had been moved. So, you know, like Oregon City, where we kind of pick up and move historic houses, that happened a little bit in Seaside as well. Um, but I haven't found a ton of history. The owners of the Starry Night have had a couple little experiences. And so we thought it would be a cool place to investigate last year because, you know, when you have kind of a rumor of a place being haunted or the owners don't really know the history, one of the best things to do is try to bring in, um, you know, some paranormal groups or um, psychics to go in and just see what they pick up. And actually, um, a lot of us picked up quite a bit last year, um, mm -hmm. which which added to the possibility that this place might actually have um, some paranormal activity going on. Um, one of the coolest stories, I think, and you, I know you know this story, and I'm sure you probably talked Pete Pete Orbea was um, um, there last year and had a couple experiences there so at the house and saw a figure of a woman that he actually thought was someone on the. Uh, tour but it was not and so we've talked about that um but the other investigation that we were super excited about which i have to downplay my excitement because it's all it's sold out in two nights um the uh, masonic lodge in seaside um the old masonic lodge we um, put tickets up for an investigation there Mm -hmm. And um, we we sold that out in, um, yeah, just two days. So um, that one, I think, I, is definitely going to be an opportunity for people to uh, explore next year, I think, because this year it was kind of a last minute thing. We wanted to try it out. I'd met the owner of the Masonic Lodge in Seaside last year, and the mm -hmm. building's kind of in a renovation mode. So um, I'm hoping it'll be in a location for us in the future, too. So if people still feel kind of disappointed about missing out on that, I think it will be an opportunity in the future. Great. I know that's one place I'd like to go. Um, yeah. and uh, check it out. You were just that one in, in independence, right? Or yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And it's haunted. And of course. you know, <laughs> the one in Port Gamble is haunted. The one in Oregon city is haunted. Oregon city had the first lodge west of the Mississippi. What is it with Masonic Lodges and ghosts, I wonder? <laughs> Just as you were talking, it clicked to me. Wait yeah. a minute. Everyone yeah. I know about has ghosts. Yeah, and I think um, 
Well, you know, even if it isn't, even if it isn't specific ghost stories, I mean, the, the mystery surrounding the Masonic Lodge and the Masons mm -hmm. itself is um, kind of intriguing to people. So I think that adds a little bit to the mystery, whether or not they're physically actually haunted or not. But um, right. so I think there is, um, you know, kind of a, 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 a hidden history and, um intrigue that people just want to know about and and when you go into a building like that um especially these old uh organizations um you'll find remnants of the history of that place which is which is really cool um mm -hmm. the seaside uh masonic lodge you know there was the building's been completely cleared out but there's still some signs around or you'll see um there was a, a framed picture of all the um you know, um, leaders in the Masonic Lodge in Oregon. I don't know what their titles are, um, but uh, <laughs> I, I could make them up, I assume. But um, so actually one of them was Joseph Lane was was in the Masons, which was um, interesting to me. I, I kind of, you know, a lot of the leaders in, in early history and even today are still involved in, in the Masonic Lodge right. or other other groups like that. It, it wasn't long ago and everybody who was anybody was a Mason. Right. Um, and I grew up with a couple, I, not directly in my family, but some of my dad's friends. And, yeah. Um, oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, now where the, the Starry Night, I did a class with Vivian there yet last year and I don't remember everything that happened, but I know people picked up on a lot of stuff. It's definitely an active place. Um, the theater, I didn't go on the investigation, but um, I was probably giving a tour or something. And um, I've heard, I've been to the theater, it's fantastic. And I, I'm sure the investigation would be fantastic there. Tell them how they get into the apartment above the bridge tender. <laughs> um, well, it's a ladder. Um, so the upstairs, the bridge tender, um, there was a fire also in that building, uh, separate from the historic fire in the seaside. Um, and when they remodeled the building they kind of used the upstairs second floor um for a lot of the um, duct work and stuff for the air system and various things like that and and they never they never recreated access to get upstairs so um there is literally in the office a ladder that you climb up and go up there um, and that's mainly just because the bridge tender now uses the upstairs only for storage. So, um, yeah, you have to go basically through a hole in the ceiling to get up the upstairs. <laughs> and what was in the... Uh... You, <laughs> you come up through an old bathroom. And, yeah, the hole in the floor is essentially the um, where the toilet was. But... Um, it's been widened. The hole has been widened. <laughs> you can get up there. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. So I, I, funny. I wanted to get that out there. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's basically, you know, right above, pretty close to right above the restrooms from the lower part of the bridge tender, which, um, you know, are, are fairly active. In terms I've watched of the normal. door. I've watched a, the men's room door. I can't remember if it opened or closed and there was nobody around it. Nobody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, and that wasn't even at night. That was in the middle of the day. People think you have to go stunt at night. You don't No. Um, they're around all the time. Um, just ask anybody who's spent much time in my house. So <laughs> now um, who are, what are some of the highlights that people can expect as far as, uh speakers um some new uh, some of the new additions ideas um yeah. classes and stuff okay let me talk about some of them uh, we try we try to um switch up classes and events every year and we you know there's a lot of people we bring back um but we 
we kind of flip flop things year to year. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to do always try to look for some type of new event. Um, this year, like I said, we didn't have the opportunity for there's several films that are in production right now. Um, we premiered Ross Allison's movie at the ghost conference um, and um, the all around us movie a while back. So we have been thankful to work with the theater in in Seaside just so that we have these potential opportunities to premiere new to premiere new movies. But um, since there are a couple right now that are in production and we don't really have a premiere, we wanted to do something different on Friday night this year. And so we're going to have uh, Michael Kane, who is from uh, Washington, do a comedy hypnotist show, which we've never done uh, at the Ghost Conference. I've, of course, like many of us have probably seen um, these type of shows at the county fair or, or, or whatever, where, um, you know, the audience is part of the show and is a um, volunteer to come up on stage. Um, and this show will be kind of themed more paranormal based. So um, it'll have some little, um, you know, things tied to the paranormal or to, it's basically a restructure of a, a Halloween show, but um, it'll be kind of cool and, and, and in the theme of, of the event. Um, and that's going to be Friday night, uh, the opening night of the conference. So um, uh, 10 o'clock at the convention center. So we're excited about that. Um, Sarah Lemos is going to be doing a gallery reading on Saturday night. And Sarah Lemos has been a really good friend of the Oregon Ghost Conference. She is, uh, you know, here in Oregon. She's from Salem, Oregon. And she has, um, you know, been in a lot of paranormal shows. She's known mostly for uh, Ghosts of Morgan City on the Travel Channel. Um, but she has appeared in Ghost Town Terror and Porters, Portals to Hell and the Osbournes uh, show. Uh, want to believe. So she's doing a lot of those kind of events and shows on the Travel Channel. And um, she's just, she's super approachable and uh, super nice. Um, she stops by, she kind of is a frequent in downtown Oregon City sometimes, and I get to see her when she stops by. And um, she always says hi. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, she's got her uh, gallery reading on uh, Saturday night, a week from tonight, and um, mm -hmm. that'll be at 7.30. And um, basically, for both her show and um, Michael Caine's uh, Hypnotist show, there's plenty of tickets still available for those shows. So uh, we'll encourage people to um, attend those. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else? I, I'm doing um, a little something different this year. Um, and, you know, this is another plug, I guess, for the shows I just talked about. Um, I tend to miss the shows when I'm doing tours. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've downgraded the amount of tours I'm doing this year, at least the weekend of the Ghost Conference, because some people will be in Seaside throughout spring break. So I'm going to do ghost tours throughout spring break as well. So if you Great. don't get to do it next weekend, uh, just check um, hauntedseaside.com and I'll be doing tours in, in Seaside Spring Break. But one of the things I'm going to do is a daytime ghost tour. Um, I got ahead of my work. And so there's some of us that believe that I may actually be able to do some things other than sit be behind a desk and a computer all weekend. So um, they, I'm going to do a history mystery tour on Saturday, midday at three o'clock. Oh, that um, sounds fascinating. It's, yeah, it's going to be a ghost. It's going to mix the kind of the ghost tour that we do, but mm -hmm. it's going to be a little bit of, you know, daytime. And, and actually part of that tour, we're going to go into the Masonic Lodge and into the Starry Night. So people actually get to go into the buildings as part of that tour. Um, and then um, let's see what else I. Um, oh, because I think I'm going to have all this free time. Um, which is probably not accurate, but um, the committee that helps put the co ghost conference together, we do a kids area. And so I've been assigned to do face painting in the kids area <laughs> Saturday. So um, that'll be fun. I like to do that. So I'll be painting um, ghosts on kids' faces and stuff. Um, let's see, what else? 
we have um i'm trying to think of some of the newer things um the classes you know we have a lot of uh, new classes um, those are things that are always changing we have oh gosh 30 over just over 30 classes wow and um one other thing that's really exciting about this year is um, we have over 60 vendors. Um, last year, well, our biggest year, I think, was in the 40s or 50s in terms of vendors. So we, um, you know, down last we were down a little bit last year in vendors just because we were coming out of the uh, pandemic and we had kind of planned we had a short planning season for the ghost mm -hmm. conference. And so um, we've managed to build our vendors back up. And um, so, yeah, over 60 vendors that we have. So the spacing in that place is going to be really, you know, packed out. We have a lot of things going on. Um, Portland Ghostbusters is going to be doing activities with uh, kids on Saturday um, in the kids area, slime making and things like that. And they are so good with that. They are awesome. They're big and, kids themselves. Yes. And I am joining this group. I'm good. slowly, slowly getting my act together. Um, you know, Joss Rose. Um, he's, yeah, he's, he's joined their group. And um, so there's several friends of mine already in that group that I'm going to have hopefully help me help assist me in getting my act together um, in terms of the equipment that I need and all of that. But um, I heard I'm going to get a little jump start at the ghost conference because they're going to give me a little, a uh, little something, I guess they're going to make a presentation for some of the new um, ghostbusters that are coming. Um, I know people that are in part of the in charge and stuff of that group. I hope they broadcast it live and be, <laughs> Be very careful. You have, you never know what you're going to get into with that sure. group. It could be yes. hilarious. Yes. Um, and there is a rumor that um, there are going to be some surprises that they're bringing out there. If anyone went to the um, Fan Expo um, in Portland, um, the Portland Ghostbusters have um, a lot of really cool props. And so I know they're going to bring a lot of that. And we do believe that um, there may be a vehicle driving out or heading out to Seaside. So um, we'll be keeping that a little bit undercover. But um, I think most of you know what I'm talking about. So hopefully um, that'll be a good surprise. Um, we've had issues with that before. <laughs> uh, that's why <laughs> I'm, I'm hesitant because, um, you know, our uh, friend Tom Guile or my friend Tom Guile um, in Oregon City, he... Um, I got a call one day at Oregon city high school where I teach. And um, basically, you know, during the school day, I don't typically answer my phone. Um, I always get text messages. So I returned this call and it was a call from um, some production assistants from uh, Portlandia, the TV show. And why, why William, when I get calls from TV shows, it never is me that they want to talk to. I mean, they want to talk to me, but they have some other things. So, so uh -huh. I, I frequently get these calls um, for production assistance or um, scouting locations, you know, for scouting mm -hmm. locations or other things. So because of my ghost tours, they said, well, hey, um, do you have a hearse? Like we saw your website. We thought, you know, if anyone's going to have a hearse, it would be someone that does ghost tours. And I said, no, I don't have a hearse, but I do know somebody that has a hearse. And they're like, oh, so anyway, Tom had his hearse being used in the um, episode of um, Portlandia where they had the goth couple that, you know, is driving to the beach in this hearse. And the episode is really hilarious because they they cram all their gothic creepy stuff into the back of this hearse and they drive to the coast. Well, they make it, you know, halfway to the coast and the, the hearse breaks down. And so the whole episode is about them having to go and find a, a rental car at, um, you know, some rental place and they get this little dinky car. <laughs> and so they have to, take out all the crap from their hearse coffins and skeletons and all this stuff and cram it into this little dinky car and, and head to the beach. Um, so anyway, that episode had come out 
right before the ghost conference a few years ago. And I thought, oh my gosh, Tom, we have to, we have to bring the hearse to the coast. One, because it'd be cool to have mm -hmm. it in the building, but also because it's so funny connected with the show that we can basically tell people, you know, the hearse has been repaired and it's going to be, they're heading to the coast again and you can come see it. Right. Well, you know what happened. <laughs> um, sometimes art imitates life or vice versa. And so uh, um, a lot of people heading to the coast were passing Tom and Dave uh, on the side of the road um, trying to fix the hearse because the hearse had broke down somewhere along Highway 26 going up the mountain. So um, we ended up having to have it towed into seaside and towed it and basically push it into the convention center <laughs> but it did get there um oh, wow. so anytime you have these old cars that are um pretty cool it's like okay are they gonna make it to the coast do we have to tow them to the coast do we need to rent a trailer how do we do this and so it's not as easy as as you would think um and then getting the vehicle into the building which um you know you have all the planning and who sets up booths first and how you get the logistics of getting a car in there and all of that. So right. with all good luck, um, we should have a surprise vehicle parked inside the convention center this, this year. Good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, um, well, tell us too, a little bit more about what do you have coming up with tours? Cause I know every once in a while, um, you change it up and um i know you've expanded greatly from what when i was doing tours with you and we expanded a lot when i was there yeah and um, in oregon city or in seaside or both oh do both yeah okay um well like i said i am gonna do ghost tours in seaside um the weekend of the ghost conference uh, pete is gonna help with some of the tours so it's really just me and pete um, so we're not doing as many tours and I think that's okay. Cause, um, we have, we've added some other investigations and evening events. And so, um, there are people that, um, there are definitely new people that will want to go on the tours, but some of them already have. So I think, um, we aren't preparing for as many big crowds on the tours for the weekend of the ghost conference. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to do the, um, kind of the oceanfront uh, area and um, Pete's going to stick to kind of the downtown area. Okay. Um, let's see. So those, the, the seaside tours for the ghost conference will kind of stay the same. And then I'll be doing tours myself the rest of the week of spring break there. Um, and I think actually the rest of the week of spring break, I'm going to combine the tours and not try to do two tours a night, just do kind of a best of seaside right. where I combine the best stories of that. Um, and, uh, let's see in Oregon city. Um, I'm getting calls, <laughs> I'm getting calls and, um, emails from people like, when are you, when are you starting the tours? Cause as you know, in the winter season, I'm, you know, full fledged into school mode and typically city stuff. And, um, people see my little storefront downtown and are like, when is he actually doing tours or is he closed? And it's like, yes, I'm still doing tours, but tours, We'll pick up again when the ghost conference is over because my whole life is focused on that right now. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I do have tours in Oregon City planned again for the summer. Um, the we uh, website and tour schedule isn't fully um, planned out just yet because I it will be as soon as I get done with the ghost. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm actually hoping to. Um, and also I try to take some time off in the summer, so I have to work my summer ghost schedule around that, but I'm right. actually hoping to start planning. I'm actually hoping to start Oregon city tours a little sooner this year. I usually start in July, um, mm -hmm. but I want to maybe start, you know, May or June. Um, and, and if the weather's good, um, right. which wasn't the case last year, <laughs> Last year, I kept saying to people, oh, we're going to start, you know, tours fairly early. But, you know, it rained so bad last year. Uh, right. So it just depends on that. Uh, but definitely be doing to my regular schedule, you know, spring, summer through um, Halloween. 
I usually take um, a little bit of time off the beginning of the school year in September and then um, start the tours back up for Halloween and then Christmas. Okay, yeah. And you've often had special focus on, you know, a solstice or a, Hall or a Christmas or a different kinds yeah. of thing where yeah. it, it, you, you make it holiday specific. Yeah, and uh, so right now, um, you know, I, I haven't brought back some of my other specialty like tours, like the Christmas one is probably the most specific one. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll do a tour for like full moon or something like that or Friday the 13th. Um, but, you know, what I'm really still holding back on is um, starting back bus tours. Like I was doing some bus tours for a while every couple, right. you know, a couple times a year I would try to do that. Um, right. I haven't done any of those since, you know, the pandemic. And so, um, you know, that's another thing I would like to start back up at some point um, is trying to offer some other tours that are not just um, not just Oregon City, but, you know, might connect a couple attractions or, or have people go to multiple places on a bus and, and, and do that. So um, I'd like to start that back up. And I'm also trying to get back into doing some of the history talks that we did uh, before the pandemic. So um, Jeff Davis has been hosting a paranormal pub out at Vancouver. And so I've been assisting with that off and on. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to get something more um, like I was doing at the uh, McMinimans. So um, those are really good. That was a lot of fun. And, you know, they, yeah. they, they are slowly building back their events too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, they're building back their events and things like that, but they haven't brought everything back online in terms of their special presentations and stuff. So I hope that happens because I know, you know, the it looks like the UFO festival is back in full force with Nick Minimans. And um, so hopefully some of the other things that they had done in the past will come back too. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Because those talks, those were very well received. I know I enjoyed the ones I was able to get to. Yeah, um, yeah, because they and they're affordable. They're you know yeah. it's yeah it's um they're they're a nice way for people to get out and um enjoy themselves without having to take out a loan. Yeah, they they did the you know we did the um, paranormal pub at Kennedy School, which had moved from um, gosh downtown to the kennedy school um once right was, it was at the white eagle for a little while well they did one uh, the white eagle i did a separate series at the white eagle later oh um, okay that's what that was, was. The mission theater mission theater was where right. they were doing it for a while um, i did one there myself to um kennedy school and so I really missed that. That was a lot of fun because, yeah, you just it was free admission and you you got there and you could get some food and, and um, drinks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, the White Eagle one, since the venue is smaller, they there was a, a cover charge or a, a, an entrance fee for that. But um, um, because they just don't have that much space. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 And you did some investigation tours in that as well. Upstairs. Yeah. I was Doing some, um, you could kind of get a separate um, uh, joint ticket to do a tour before the talks at White Eagle. So I would do kind of a tour of the bar and the hotel, and then um, then we would I would do the talk after that. Yeah. Okay. I would love to start that back up again. It was a lot of fun. It, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. You know? um, and as you know, I. I you and so many of our other friends, you know, host these um, shows multiple times a month or, or at least once a month, some, uh, mm -hmm. some of them and um, helping Jeff Davis with the paranormal pub in Vancouver. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot to come up with a topic every, every month, or even, you know, some people that are doing it a couple times a week or something. That's um it's a lot to prepare for. It's a lot to schedule. Um, mm -hmm. So as much as I enjoyed it, I was like, okay, every month I was like, I got a new topic. I got to research this. And it's, it's, it takes a time if you want to do a good job. So it does. It yeah. does. And that's, that's why my show I do twice a month. Yeah. That's, that's the max I can commit to um, just because I know with everything else and 
life in general. Um, I like it well, to be a I decent found, product. What I found too, though, for for like your show or like Pete's show or even mm -hmm. um, um, Nicole Strickland or anyone else, um, yeah. when you know the people you're talking to, it makes it just a conversation. So it's not as you know, I enjoy doing radio interviews with them and you um, mm -hmm. just because it's um, it's just it's fairly casual. I mean, yes, you still prepare for it. And you still have an idea of what you want to cover, but um, it makes it nice where you can do that, where it's not such a high pressure thing, because some of us, you know, believe it or not, still, you know, get a little anxiety when we do speak in front of groups or whatever. <laughs> it's something that I've worked on for my whole life and people are shocked when I say that, but yeah, I still get nervous or I still get, you know, um, kind of uh, a little um, worried, you know, anytime I do a presentation. So, you know, that like, if it's anywhere within 24 hours of me doing a presentation or something, I'm just completely focused on studying what I'm talking about and all of that. And um, it always works out, you know, yeah. I don't think I've ever had any disasters, <laughs> but not that I've seen as you over plan and you over, you know, um, prepare and um, mm -hmm. then it, it ends up being done and you're like, oh, well, that went well or that went easy. <laughs> and then you just think, well, I guess I can do that again next month. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, and I, I know what you mean. Why would shoot when I was AFS president and high school and we had the big yearly um uh presentation to the entire school i had somebody else give it i was too nervous <laughs> up there grad school we had yeah. to give um joint and solo presentations in every class in my graduate program and i was also going to city club and yeah. saying oh i do as well as they do oh okay no problem so now i love it you know, yeah. it's like, give me the microphone as long as I know what I'm talking about. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. If I don't uh, know what I'm talking yeah. about, it's like, stay away. As a student and, you know, as a, a student, but also as a teacher, you know, I've never been one that likes to force my students to do presentations, but mm -hmm. I feel it's important. And I try to give students the opportunity to do that. Um, and I think we all should, because it is such an important skill to have. Um, I know that when I was a kid, I was scared to death of it. And I, I, I remember, you know, um, singing or, you know, doing things in elementary school where we had to do, you know, a play for our parents or whatever, or um, mm -hmm. any type of thing like that. And I was scared out of my mind. Um, I was in this little drama class at uh, Mount Pleasant way back when I was a kid. And, um, I had a part in the school play and I had to say like one sentence. I, I don't even remember what it was. I remember a lot of it was singing and stuff, but I had to come out on stage and I had to give one line. I got so scared. I couldn't do it. And so the, um, the day of the play, I said, I'm not doing it. Like I am not doing this. I can't do it. I won't do it. Um, but I enjoyed being a part of it so much. I was like, is there anything that I can do other than that? Uh -huh. And I, um, you know, now it seems kind of horrible, but I, I, the only job that I did that night was I was behind the stage. I opened the curtain and I closed the curtain. <laughs> okay. And that was my um, first experience behind the scenes, which I was like, okay. I'm all about behind the scenes. I will, I will help on these shows. I really got into the drama department at the high school and enjoyed doing some of that. And it wasn't until, you know, later in high school that I started being in student council, being able to speak a little bit. And then as I got older into college, making presentations or things for Dornbecker Children's Hospital or fundraisers or talking to the school board or whatever, and then running for um, city commission at some point. But if it wasn't for that ability to have an opportunity to be involved without just being flat out on stage, I don't know that I ever would have got there. And and now I can kind of, you know, um, 
it's almost like I you take on a different persona, right? Like when when I'm teaching, I'm kind of a, that's a different person really than my my interior self. And right. then when I'm doing things like presentations, so I can kind of go into that teaching mode where I can connect with people, um, and I don't get as nervous with that, especially if I have prepared enough for it. Um, but um, so I I definitely still. Um, Question, you know, get nervous occasionally on things. If it's it definitely it's a new thing or a new, new presentation or a new location or something like that. But I never liked the fact that you know um, people would force you to do something like that. So it's like I, I feel, but it's also such an important thing. Like I said, for people to have an opportunity to try that. And now, you know, I love being in these plays. Um, uh, if I, you know, I actually, as a teacher, was in a couple plays at the high school, and um, I've always been interested in kind of, um, you know, behind the scenes stuff, but also in movies or TV and things like that. And actually, lately, with several projects like you have been working on and other people in the paranormal world, I've been able to be a part of some of those projects in terms right. of doing movies or shows. So, um, you know, and that's that opens the door to a whole lot of other possibilities where people are creating these new projects that are so exciting. Um, you know, doing the project on the Irma Tanger House, which um, I can't wait to see how it turns can't out. Either. Um, is there any updates? I, I guess I'll, I'll interview you for a second. Is there any? <laughs> <laughs> um, not yet. I know he's been hard at work. Um, I, I'm not sure where we are. I met with Ben a couple a month or two ago. I gave him some photos from the Irma Tinger House to go through to look at for B-roll. And um, he and I are also talking about another project. Very cool. Yeah, hopefully that'll turn out. Um, yeah, well, that was a lot of fun. So I, I think any, any of those collaborations that can happen, um, especially focused on paranormal or, or history. I, I think it's really cool. Yeah. And the two go together so well. I mean, I think you're the one that first said, or the first time I heard it, you don't have paranormal without history and you don't have history without paranormal. Um, they just go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's fun to see and it's fun to watch people learn and expand and grow and um, expand the boundaries a little bit and um, you know so many other pieces to it I, uh, for me anyway I love it what you just said a minute ago with the paranormal and the history I think I, I'm trying to think um, of the saying what it was um it wasn't mine well the, i have a saying too of kind of haunted places but mm -hmm. um it's in history repeating itself right um, right because i think that's kind of an explanation for that but um uh jay verberg uh, uh -huh. you know jay right oh yeah very well very well we both do um and i wanted to say what was his he had a t-shirt that he was wearing that he had come up with this saying and i was like oh my god that's that's brilliant like it was a really great um thing and i gosh i wonder if i can find it. i think i think i remember what it was i think it was um i think his t-shirt said if you're dead your history okay <laughs> and i thought i love that that's fantastic. And I don't remember. I don't remember what it was. It's been and a while. I said, you need to, or maybe I think actually, no, it was on a, it was on one of his presentations at the okay. ghost conference where he put, if you're dead, your history. Mm -hmm. And I said, that has to be a t-shirt. Like you need to, Jay, you need to do this and you need to market this. Cause this, this, this is a, I would wear that t-shirt. Right. right. Um, it's so great. Yeah. Oh, no, there's, we've been fortunate. We've met a lot of really incredible human beings in the process of working with history and that history that repeats itself, which is right. your line. Yeah. Right. 
um, <laughs> some really good ones. And uh, it's it's good to see. I, I think all in all, eh, I still say there there are more good. There's more good and more good people out there than the other, but uh, whether or not it always feels like it. Yeah, it, that's, that's true. That is really true. Yeah, it helps keep me going. Um, well, let's see. I know a lot of people have been pushing you. I'm putting you on the spot now. Oh, um, great. Is this when the that, that's okay, because I've known you for a long time. We've been good friends for forever. The hard-hitting questions are starting now. That's right. Um, you have been pressed on and off ever since I've known you. I've been one of the ones who's pressed you. You've pressed yourself on this. Oh, I think I know where you're going. When are the books coming out? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know, William. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, it, realistically, I think when I, I don't have a real job anymore, I think that's, I think that's going to be the, the thing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, yeah, I have talked to Jeff Davis about this cause he asked me about this all the time. Um, you know, Jeff's written so many books and, right. and. I have a lot of stories in my head and a lot of stories written on scrap pieces of paper. Um, and eventually it will come into a book, but I, I think what I need to do is, um, I, you know, I, I compartmentalize so many parts of my life because I go from one thing to another mm -hmm. that really there isn't room for another thing in there. Um, so what I need to do is really, you know, schedule a day or once a week or once a month or whatever, even if it's just a little bit of time to mm -hmm. start. And, and kind of, that's what Jeff said. He says, well, just do one story a day or one story a month or right. whatever, you know, keep up, do something that way. So at least that you're making progress towards it. Um, because I think that's the problem. You, when you take on a project that like that, at first it seems so overwhelming that you have, it's kind of like when, you know, your apartment's a mess and you're like, well, I don't even know where to start. So then you just don't. <laughs> right. I do know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then it's like, oh, gosh, OK, so where do I start? And and, and there's so and there's be times to me where it's like, OK, I can't do anything until I clean everything. And then there's other times that it's just like, well, it's too overwhelming. So I think that's part of it. I think if you compartmentalize it and you can focus on it. I need to come up with a schedule to start doing that. Um, mm -hmm. But I I did do, I guess my first extent into that was um, Seekers of the Paranormal, which was a, a book that came out with Lauren Christensen. Um, and Lauren Christensen was a, a guest at one of the ghost conferences uh, pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he is... Um, I really was intrigued by him because he writes a lot of books, but one of his books was about um, police. He was a former police officer okay. and um, he wrote a book about basically paranormal experiences that cops have um, wow. or that EMTs or firefighters have had. So mm -hmm. when they respond to these kind of events and the experiences that they've had, um, and, you know, a lot of my family were police officers or are currently police officers. And so um, and based on my knowledge of, you know, some of those police officers and how police officers are so fact based or, right. or um, science based to some degree that the paranormal is like, well, I don't know, you know, where's the mm -hmm. proof? You know, they right. want where the proof is. Um, and so I've had interesting conversations even with my dad about that because my dad is a true cop and was mm -hmm. you know, retired um, who didn't just, just does not buy a lot of this stuff. like Including uh, loaves of bread floating across the aisle. Right, exactly. So um, that always was intriguing to me. And so, so Lauren Christensen's book was kind of interesting and so uh, interesting to me. And so I had him come to the Oregon Ghost Conference um, as a speaker. And then later on that next year, he started this new project, which was Seekers of the Paranormal, which is 
a book of um, paranormal investigators, um, you know, across the United States. And he basically created a series of questions or an interview, essentially, mm -hmm. of these various people and then had each of those people tell their story um, as part of this book. So even though he was the overall author, each of us basically wrote our chapters in the sense that we were writing responses to this these questions. Okay. Um, and so that was my first step in actually sitting down, writing stories out and planning it out. And, um, you know, that book came out and it was really, really cool. And so, um, you know, that's the closest I've got. That's my, that was my test run. Okay. Um, okay. And, and having Lauren tell me that, Hey, you know, that worked out pretty good. Um, having another writer tell you that, Oh, what you did was, was good or that you could do this um, gave me, cause I've actually always liked to write. I'm not a big, I'm not, I'm more a writer than I am a reader mm -hmm. because I like to create stories. And I like to um, kind of um, tell stories. So, right. That's always been something I've enjoyed, but the time to sit down and actually type it out every day is the is the challenge. So I will get there. I will definitely get there. I, I that's the thing. I, I'm I'm waiting for the day I can quit my real job because there are so many other and you know me, William. You know I yeah. can't come up with crazy ideas. Um there's a lot of other ideas in my head that I want to spend time on. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly wanting to create new things or do new things. So, um, but there's only so much time in the world and I get exhausted and, you know, on the two or three weeks that I have per year that I'm like, Oh, you know what? I could write a book or I could go on vacation. Um, guess which one I choose. <laughs> exactly. So uh -huh. Yeah. And I look at writing the books about the vacation and I've got a few right. of them started. Well, see, but, maybe that's and I love to and I love to write as well. I mean, I really do. But I just look at sometimes the projects and I go, uh, I gotta do this today instead. Um You but you um well see maybe that's the thing. You you know, write write um the books based on the travel, but because then it's it intertwines both, but um I assume that you don't write while you're there or do you write parts when you're on, when you're traveling and you're writing, do you write some of it when you're there and then you come back or do you come and finish it? Or do you in just take on the experience while you're part of it and then process the, that afterwards? The Does goal is to write part of it while I'm there. Right. The reality is right. at, at some point after I'm back, and I take copious video notes. I don't right. write because right. part of it's history, part of it's legend, part of it's experience, part of it's mediumship and everything. And I have to talk or record other people talking. I'm trying to write it down. I break connections and it just doesn't. It triggers my ADHD brain to go off. And I, you know, I don't remember what happened. But um, then the goal is to come back and put it all together. Right. But of course, the video notes take longer to go through and put together than written notes would be. So, um, yeah, and it's just me being an idiot. But, you know, people say stick to your strengths. So I'm pretty good at being an idiot sometimes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but but I know I love I used to I mean, people think I'm crazy, but I used to love writing papers um at university uh, especially history papers and because that was the degree and even in public administration where i got my master's like papers projects things like that it was interesting i got to think i was yeah. made that i had to think put things together and i couldn't be lazy about it i had to actually show up and do the work and yeah. i love the work but it's hard to get me moving Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, like, I don't know if I would say I liked writing papers in college. I mean, I liked part of it. I liked, um, I like to make connections to things that maybe no one else sees. Like, I, right. that's what I enjoy. I like to see, take all this information and 
throw it together in my own way to try to make connections that are in, interesting or unique or make you think about it. Um, mm -hmm. Which is what I do with my tours, essentially, is you know, right. all these bits and pieces. Um, so that I enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. How like something from here at this time affected yeah. something over here at right. this time that right. affected something. Yeah, um, that's part of the fascination. And that that's a process that never stops. That's something that you once you get started with it, it just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know well, I don't do so many video um, things, but I do. I I use my um, audio recorder on my phone frequently. Like if I'm out doing tours and someone's like, "Oh, well, I had this experience," I'll make some notes of that. And then, uh -huh. unfortunately, time goes on, and you like, "Oh, I looked at my phone the other day, and I was playing recordings of." various things you know because if i do a tour in seaside and someone tells me a cool story well then at the end of the night i'll kind of say what i remember onto a recording and then mm -hmm. you know forget about it and then later go back to it and say oh my god i forgot that you know right and having that record of this story um which is not always you know it's someone's perception of their story but as you know you might hear some crazy story from somebody saying, well, I had this experience and you think to yourself, well, it's not very believable, but it's interesting. Right. And you have that recording on your phone. And then maybe three years later, someone's in the same place and they say, well, you, you know, this happened to me. And you're like, well, wait a minute that I've heard this before. <laughs> right. Told me this. And yes, at the time it seemed absolutely unbelievable, but now, I'm seeing a pattern of people having the same kind of experience. And then you're like, okay, there's something to this. Exactly. Especially when they're unconnected people, right. they don't know a, a lore about the place or the, you know, the location was X, X Y, and Z happening. Um, it makes it interesting. And the coast is super haunted. I mean, well, Oregon city is super haunted. Like you say, They've moved all the houses and they moved all the bodies. Um, <laughs> yeah. At least from downtown. Um, maybe. They maybe. They, they maybe. said they moved yeah. them all. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. interesting. When you read reports about a, a cemetery that's located on Main Street and you read, oh, there were 13 people buried there. Then you read in another, these are historic documents or books, right. 30 people. And then another says 50. And then you talk to people who are in charge of the cemetery where they really are now. And they say, uh, we really didn't know. Um, right. Because the records were gone and the wooden crosses were gone after a hundred years. Right. So, yeah. And hmm. that, that has been a mystery definitely um, that I've been trying to, to to investigate a little bit more the last couple of years and mm -hmm. um part of it is you know the pioneer history but so much of it is the native history in oregon city and mm -hmm. seaside uh seaside i would say the same thing um right all these places had a history before the settlers got here and you know where we built these towns um, it was very much on sacred sites um, in a lot of places, in a lot of areas. So, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we don't talk about it enough. We and, and you have to be careful when you talk about it because you want to be respectful and you also want to be protective of these sites. But right. we weren't protective of these sites in our history. And, and so, you know, now wanting to do that, you still have to be careful with it because by doing that and knowing about where the sites are actually opens the door to problems itself. Right. So it's, it's um, really delicate. Cause I don't want to, I, I don't want to, um, make, I don't want to leave out pieces of this place's history but you have to be very careful how you do that and especially when it's um not your history right or or exactly. another, another group's history you want to be respectful of that history and make sure that you're um, honoring it in the right way um, mm -hmm. that's that's very delicate it is it really is and um fortunately most of the history nowadays i talk about 
is you know the the peoples have changed um right. um the people that settled um the minoan cultures on the western shores of turkey are not the same people that live there now um right. it helps or you know the people that built stonehenge are different now and um so it helps but um but with some of the rest of it it can be it can be challenging i know i've got one story from native americans in oregon city in the first book i did and it it verifies historically but um you know they're the ones that told me to write it but i still had to be think about it and i the dead are the ones that told me to write it not the living tribal members so right, right. and i'm not even sure which tribal members because it was an area where people came during hunting and fishing seasons gathering from all right. over they came for hundreds of miles so um i don't know it was just all of these people talking to me it's like okay um i had permission to be out there at night um i don't trespass and i i don't go places where i'm not supposed to be without you know making sure it's okay with the powers that be whatever that is it's just polite i i put that in as a reminder for people yeah now we're right oh we just passed the three o'clock mark do you have anything else you want to add or to put in or say any other um promote yourself the conference <laughs> yeah i mean i will just say uh we hope to see people out at seaside um next weekend uh march 24th through the 26th for the oregon ghost conference and uh, tickets are available online at uh, OregonGhostConference.com. Um, yeah, we have, I will say there might be a couple other things. There's a couple other things I didn't mention that um, we haven't promoted a ton, but as exciting is um, some friends of ours um, are doing a um, special event on Saturday. There's a couple things on Saturday that aren't happening the rest of the weekend. Um, on Saturday, we have the kids area, and then on a uh, week from today, we have like the kids area there. We have the um, we have uh, the opportunity for people to play a new video game, and um, I know you'd be interested in this actually because it's called the video game's called The Haunting of the Flavel House. Ah, and so some friends of ours have been working on this. They're taught it's based on um, the well, I don't know how based it is on the true history, but a lot of the characters of the video game, the old Flavel house or the, right. the, the empty Flavel house. Um, and um, so they're going to actually present, uh, have an opportunity for people to play the first two levels, I think, of the video game because the video game is still in production. And so right. that's kind of cool. And for people that don't know what the Flavel house is, it's there's set two Flavel houses in Astoria, which have some incredible history and ghost stories associated with them. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, Ouija, Ouija Ama, or Ouija Mania, sorry, Ouija Mania, which is a documentary. Um, so again, we talked about um, some of the movie productions that have been going on. Um, so mm -hmm. at Port Campbell, um, they've been filming this movie and actually they've been traveling around all over for different paranormal conferences to film a documentary about uh, Ouija boards. Um, oh. so it's um, they were filming at Port Gamble and they've been filming at the Oregon ghost conference too. So they're going to um, have kind of a question and answer about a session and a presentation about their project on Friday. Um, okay also um have a room there to interview people throughout the weekend who want to talk about their stories about ouija boards and 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 all of that pro and con and mm -hmm. all of the in between 
which I think is really fascinating. They've been working on this project for, for a couple of years, I think, because I've been hearing about it for a few years um, right. out of the pandemic, and they've been filming at all these events that we go to. Um, so it's going to be um, pretty amazing, and I'm hoping – hoping that we get to um, show it at the ghost conference, you know, when it, when this project's completed. So. Fantastic. Those sound really interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be there this year, but it just didn't work. Um, so I'll have to make sure next year there's a lot that sounds like it's too good to be missing. So people go. <laughs> Yes. And a lot of this, you know, your $15 entry for the weekend ticket gets you into so much of this. All of the speakers and presentations, yeah. um, we've, the we've vendors. Tried that low. Um, we, you know, some some conferences do a different thing. I, we've kind of kept it that way because in Seaside, there's so many people that walk in off the street that mm -hmm. they may not want to be, they may not want to buy a big package of events and things. So that gives them an opportunity to do that. But Right. Um, Fifteen dollars allows you to come in and see any of the displays or the uh, speakers on the main stage, some of the other side events that are happening there, um, and all the vendors, um, and then the special events, classes, tours, and investigations are te separate tickets. So um, you can kind of pick and choose how much or how little you want to be there. Um, so, like I said, even if someone wants to come out for the day and just check out the convention center and the, the speakers. Um, every hour we have a different speakers throughout the whole weekend and that's part of your admission. And then, like I said, we have so many vendors this year and in the vendors area, we have Psychics Row, which is palm readers, tarot card readers, fortune tellers, all, all sorts of different things that you can get readings done there. So mm -hmm. psychic readings, things like that. Yeah. So, Check it out, people. You don't want to miss it. And, you know, it's it's so good to see Seaside has its changed. When I was a kid, I am I have long roots back to Astoria. So Seaside was part of, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole boardwalk area, it was just boarded up. The Dodgem cars were open. The I think the saltwater toffee and maybe cotton candy. And the Dodge and cars were in a different place, not where they are now. Right. They were across the street. Um, but mostly it was just boarded up, when, you know, shop fronts. And it's good to see it be a vibrant place now. It's a place that feels very comfortable walking around. Yes, um, absolutely. Don't drink and drive. It's spring break. They look for drunk drivers. Um, but... Yeah, come and stay for the whole weekend. <laughs> yeah. That's it's... that's one of the best things about Seaside. I mean, you go, the events at the convention center, you're within two or three blocks from pretty much any of the hotels. You're within two or three blocks from the beach. You're within two or three blocks from the entire main strip and all the entertainment and activities. Yeah. So um, you can walk everything, you know? So yeah, if you can stay for the weekend and actually I should say this, William, people that are like right now saying, Oh gosh, I'd really like to come to the coast, but it's only a week before and it's spring break. There's probably no hotel rooms. There is hotel rooms and there's plenty of rooms still available. Mm -hmm. um, and on our website, we have links to five hotels that have rooms available and they have discounts it is a little bit more than normal because it is spring break, but the discounts will help bring that down a little bit. So right. uh, yeah, people are still, I think a lot of times people say, Oh, well, there's no way I am going to find a space still, but yes, there are still rooms available and um, encourage people to come out. Yeah. And the hotels and everybody love to see everybody come. There are tons of restaurants to eat in um, anything you want, anything from, Pancake house to um, reasonably high end dining, not fine dining, but pretty. You're getting up there to a burger or a pizza, or you know, it's um, it's a fun place to go. So, well, Rocky, I want to thank you so much. I will give you links to this after I get it uploaded, yeah. and so you can yeah. share it. And All right, William. Well, thank you. And I will, I'm sure I'll see you again really soon. I'm going back to work now. I have a whole list of 
things to get done today and tomorrow. So um, you might not hear from me right in the near future, but I'll definitely, you know, um, see you soon again. Okay. Sounds great to me. Take All care, right. everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.